Thank you. Today, I'd like to talk about Gorwa selectors, specifically about how they can be analyzed as auxiliary verbs. The selector is a central aspect of the grammar of Gorwa and of Southern Cushitic languages in general, but our understanding of the selector is still indeterminate or even vague. In Analyzing the Gorwa selector as an auxiliary verb, uh, using both morphological and distributional evidence, this talk seeks to present a novel analysis as well as provide a basis for further research on the verbal morphosyntax of Gorwa. First of all, I'd like to make a couple of notes on the data being used in today's talk. So first, a recording of this talk will be made available shortly after its live presentation, both on Zenodo at the DOI Given, as well as on YouTube via the QR code on screen. In terms of accessing the examples used in this talk, most utterances of phrasal length or longer which occur in my database are given with a unique identifier, which occurs to the right of the first line of the gloss. These unique identifiers are made up of two parts, an alphanumeric code to the left of a, full, of a full stop, and a number to the right of the full stop. The alphanumeric code features the name of the file in which the recording can be found, and so any interested listener can navigate to the Gorwa archive deposit, which you can do via the QR link on screen, and uh, enter that file name into the search bar highlighted here. This will return all of the files and folders associated with that file name, including the recording itself, as well as XML files created with the ALON software, which can be used to see transcriptions and translations of the audiovisual material. The number to the right of the full stop refers to the utterance number within the audiovisual file in which the utterance occurred. So once the ALON file has been downloaded, one can navigate to that utterance number in the ALON file and listen to the utterance as well as check it within its larger context. The specific example is highlighted here. I should add that all of the data I'll be using today was funded by two separate grants from the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, as well as a grant from the Firebird Foundation for Anthropological Research. For a sense of how Gorwa sounds, here is a brief recording of Akobu Sapware talking about harvesting sisal when he was young. Katana has ita katanda atan lo king in gagane gari. Mukuren adur atan kure ma kudet et bon deri kudoka te kame kinti kame kinti kame kinti kame gari ne nuhu katanda ne nuhar durari kanduka kuus baka kuus atan di sille ita na koko habra bon deri tu zaleki anto koko ha ti pi manaka mukuda bira har da morga bina ki at bon deri zika hati san. King <laughs> Moving now to the main topic of my talk, I would like to specify the construction upon which I will be focusing, that is, the selector. In the simplest sense, as our colleague Martin Mouse puts it, the selector, uh, here highlighted in red, is an additional inflectional element that is separate from the verb. Selectors always occur to the left of the lexical verb, here highlighted in green, but not always immediately to the left, as in the highlighted example here. Sometimes other material, like nouns and adverbs, can intervene. Selectors aren't unique to Gorwa or even to South Cushitic. In Somali, similar constructions are called indicator particles. In Oromo, they are called focus markers. Selectors do, however, reach their most morphologically complex forms in Gorwa and the other South Cushitic languages, where they can mark clause type, voice, ventivity, argument structure, 
aspect, as well as mood. Take this form, for example, which simultaneously marks a question, a reason, medio passive voice, a third person agent, a feminine gender patient, and perfective aspect. In the glossing, it can be seen that the selector itself is a complex of clitics. A central question then is what exactly are they criticizing to? This talk will submit that at the heart of selectors is an auxiliary verb. These auxiliary verbs are richly inflected, as can be seen in this schematic, which indicates everything which may be marked on the selector in roughly sequential order. The auxiliary itself, I submit, is a highly reduced phonological segment, ah, which, if accompanied by phonologically overt argument marking morphemes, is entirely phonologically reduced, that is, it's realized as phonologically zero. I'd like now to look at this ah zero alternation by examining some examples from actual constructions, two of which are highlighted here. Garma ina mama, the boy was ill, and ani ana mama, I was ill. In the first example, we can see that the selector marks a third-person sole argument of an intransitive verb. In this case, the verb is uh, the intransitive to be ill. Because it is marked with a phonologically overt argument, that is the E here, the auxiliary is realized as phonetically zero, and the selector surfaces as ina. In the second example, we can see that the selector marks a first-person sole argument of an intransitive verb, again the verb to be ill, uh, and here that uh, is glossed as P for speech act participant because first and second person uh, code the same. Because it is argument marked with an argument which itself is phonologically zero, the auxiliary is realized phonetically as A, ah, and the selector surfaces as ana. These are simple, but not really the most illustrative examples. That is, we can't really convincingly see this alternation at work, but we can see it in the copular constructions. Take, for example, garma i barat aimo, the boy is in the field, parsed and glossed as such. Here, the argument marking is realized by e, and the selector surfaces as e. In garma kuter, the boy is tall, parsed and glossed as such. We can see that this form, an adjectival predicate construction, is expressed via a medio passive in Gorwa, where the agent and the patient agreement actually refers to the same argument, that is, the boy, which makes sense in a medio passive construction in which uh, the subject both has, well, both has subject and patient uh, qualities. The argument morphemes are realized as ng and u, and uh, the auxiliary surfaces as ku. In garma agormo, the boy is a gorwa person, there is no argument marking, and the auxiliary must therefore surface phonologically as a. The reason that the first two examples have argument marking is that they are predicational copular constructions and are therefore argument marked. The third example is a specificational copula construction and therefore takes no arguments. The auxiliary employed is, however, the same and displays the alternation positive. Having introduced the auxiliary and its phonological alternation between a ah and zero, I'd like to note that Referring to the selector as verbal in nature is not really anything new. Uh, Pace Bant Banti 1997, both Mouse 1993 and 2007 establish the selector as a verb meaning something like to be. 
What is slightly more difficult is arguing the selector's role as an auxiliary verb. In a recent email exchange with our colleague and my mentor, Martin Mouse, he reminded me that if I was to make the assertion that the selector is indeed an auxiliary, I would have to first establish what exactly its lexical base was, and then establish a clear link between this lexical base and the more canonical lexical verbs in the language. Starting with the lexical base question, this has already been established as the morpheme a, ah, which alternates with a phonetic zero if it, if it occurs with a phonetically realized argument marking, as we've established earlier in the talk. Regarding whether this form can be used as a main verb, the answer is probably no. Uh, as we can see in this recycled example, the auxiliary is certainly usable as a copular verb, but that's not really the same thing. As a side note, it should be noted that Gorwa doesn't feature a lexical verb meaning to be. Similar concepts are expressed by the verb to be present. Der. Having no strong evidence that the auxiliary morpheme of the selector can be used as a lexical verb, what we now need to do instead is demonstrate its verbal nature in other ways. I'll start with morphological similarities between it and lexical verbs. Consider the following. Here we have a phrase, Munadel, he stopped by, understood to be his house. Uh, the verb here is del, to stop by. We can construct a similar phrase, Muna delit, he was stopping by his house, this time as more of a habitual state than one-off happening, by using the form delit. The medio passive verbal morpheme is a long vowel plus the consonant T. Further, we can say Muna delis, he keeps him, for example, the child, from going. In other words, he causes him to stay or stop by. Here, a causative verb is constructed by using a causative verbal morpheme, a long vowel plus the consonant S. Moving now to the selector, we have garma mu ai, the boy eats it, where the selector is mu. We can also say garma ku ai, the boy is being eaten. It's less clear at first brush, but here the middle construction is made with a T-clitic morpheme, which uh, in its surface realization is realized as a, uh, a K. Uh, the form so ai burnwa ar means when or if he sees a dog. And the selector is burnwa. To say because when he saw a dog, burnwas, so so ai burnwas ar, we employ an additional morpheme on the selector, the clitic S. That is, the clitic morpheme S imparts a reason meaning on the phrase. The similarity, both formal and semantic, between the middle morpheme of the selector and the medio-passive morpheme on the lexical verb, and the reason clitic on the selector and the causative morpheme on the lexical verb is striking. So striking, in fact, that it is hard to believe that they did not have the same origin. Finally, I would like to point out another morphological similarity between selectors and main verbs. That is, the similarity between the final vowel of the lexical verb and what I have been calling the auxiliary itself. Because of widespread apocope, the final vowel of the lexical verb is not typically realized phonetically. None of the examples given earlier feature a phonologically overt final vowel. Compare, however, funai i xia, I like meat, which also has no overt final vowel, and gari aloa xia kang, which means I really don't like this thing, which does feature a phonologically overt final vowel. The negative enclitic prevents regular apocope from occurring, and the final vowel surfaces as a, ah, though this time it's not final in the verb word, it's, uh, it occurs before that negative clitic. Note how similar this final vowel a ah, is to the a ah of the auxiliary at the heart of the selector. Having proposed this 
morphological similarity between the auxiliary and the final vowel. I'd like now finally to point out a striking distributional similarity between the auxiliary and the final vowel. In Gorwa, all phrases bearing tense must have a selector. Again, though they are usually not pronounced, I have a strong intuition that the final vowel morphemes of the lexical verbs must also be present. In fact, the only constructions which lack final vowels on lexical verbs are imperatives, and also these uh, are the only verbal constructions which also lack selectors. So if we accept that imperatives are finite but lack tense, as Platzak and Rosengren argue in 1997, and Rotil makes the same argument in 2005, this would indicate that both the final vowels of lexical verbs as well as the auxiliary are, at their core, a kind of tense marker, and provides good evidence that Gorwa selectors are indeed a kind of auxiliary verb. To conclude then, my talk leaves at least sort of two very evident unanswered questions. If the selector is indeed a highly inflected auxiliary verb, and if this auxiliary verb is indeed cognate with the final vowel of the lexical verb, it still doesn't explain the occurrence of the ventive selector ni. This selector occurs when verbs of motion, especially motion toward the speaker, are used, and uh, entirely replaces the auxiliary about which this presentation was based today. Uh, my talk today also gives no insight about the agreement morphemes. The person, number, gender agreement on selectors is clearly entirely different from the person, number, gender agreement on lexical verbs. But if a historical explanation could be given for each of these, it would contribute even more insight into how verbal constructions came to be the way they are in Gorwa and indeed South Cushitic in general. To sort of finally conclude then, this talk posited an analysis of selectors in Gorwa which differed from that provided from other Southern Cushitic languages to date, uh, proceeding on the assumption that the lexical basis of the Gorwa selector is a morpheme which is phonologically zero if marked with at least one phonologically overt argument, and ah if no phonologically overt arguments are present, the talk drew on morphological and distributional similarities between this lexical base morpheme and lexical verbs to argue that the Gorwa selector is verbal in nature and that it is built around an auxiliary verb. Further work on other elements of the selector is needed for a clearer picture of this complex grammatical construction, but this represents a first step. Uh, thank you, and here are my references.